Does the name Pavlov ring a bell? All right, guys, welcome to Psych Explained. In this video, we're going to examine a specific type of learning called classical conditioning. Or more specifically, Ivan Pavlov's famous study, Conditioning Dogs to Salivate at the Sound of a Bell. Now, before we get into the study, let's first break down what is happening in the mind that allows this type of learning to occur in the first place. And it really comes down to this. The brain loves to form associations, right? The brain is wired to make connections between two events. And in psychology, we call this associative learning. Learning that two events occur together. We have event one and we have event two. And our brain loves to form connections between these two, right? It's like imagining my dog hearing a doorbell, right? What's he gonna do? He's gonna run to the door because he assumes and he learns that somebody's there. Or maybe it's my son cleaning his room. And I give him a treat one time, right? And now he knows going forward, every time he cleans his room, he's going to get something that's really nice, right? Or maybe I'm cutting onions, right? What's gonna happen after I cut onions? I'm gonna start crying, right? I've learned that association. So that's the first part. Our brain loves to form associations. Now we've talked about this in other videos, but can you think of any parts of the brain that allows us to form these associations? Well, first we have to have a memory of the event, right? As I cut onions, I have to remember that, right, I gotta cover my eyes or my dog knows when the doorbell rings, somebody's at the door. And that first part deals with memory. So what part of the brain deals with memory? Well, the first part we're gonna talk about is what we call the hippocampus, okay? In the hippocampus, this kind of seahorse-shaped structure deep within the limbic system helps form explicit declarative memories. And we'll talk about the difference between those as well. Now, in order for associative learning to occur also, we have to think about fear and emotions, right? Uh, if I put a collar around a dog and it learns that every time it barks, it's gonna get electrocuted, which I know, uh, it has to learn that kind of emotional fear response. And that part of the brain is what we're gonna label as the amygdala, amygdala, okay, amygdala. And this is this kind of almond-shaped structure, right, sitting next to the hippocampus. So we have the memory part, we have the emotion part, and something we're going to be talking about today, which is right back here, is something called the cerebellum. Okay, what do we know about the cerebellum? Well, the cerebellum, which is located just under the occipital lobe in the back of the head, we typically think of in terms of balance and coordination, right, coordinated movements, but it also deals with what we call procedural memories, things like riding a bike, right, tying a shoe, we don't really have to think about it. So there are a lot of parts of the brain that deal with forming these associations. Now, not every association is the same. This is really important. Let's think about this. If I touch a hot stove, what's going to happen? Well, what's gonna happen is my hand is going to jerk away, right? It's very hot. I touch that hot stove, it's gonna move away, okay? That's one type of association. Let's think about another one. You get an A in school, right? You get straight A's, what happens? Well, maybe you get an award. So you form this association that when you study really hard and you get A's, good things happen. Now on the surface, they are both types of associations. I associate touching something hot, my hand turns away. I associate studying and something good happens, but what's the difference? Can you think about any differences between the first example and the second one? Well, if you're thinking that the first one is automatic or unconscious, right? I don't choose to, my hand, it does that automatically. The second one is more voluntary and I have to think about it. That is the primary difference. So as we're talking about today, the first example deals with what we call classical conditioning, right? This kind of involuntary response. While the second one is more aligned with what we call operant conditioning, right? Behaviors with a behavior and a consequence. And the consequence could be good, the consequence can be bad. And we'll talk about operant conditioning in another video. Now this type of kind of automatic responses that do with classical conditioning, and I'll do an arrow going down here, is what we refer to as respondent behaviors, okay? These are reflexive behaviors an automatic response in response to a stimulus. Let's think about other reflexive responsive behaviors. If I blow a puff of air into your eye, what's your eye gonna do? Your eye is going to blink or flinch. Now, did you learn that? No, it happens automatically or involuntarily. It is a respondent behavior. What happens if you get stung by a bee? You don't have to learn this. 
it's going to cause pain. It's going to hurt. And what, what about a startle sound, right? You're at a restaurant and somebody drops a lot of glasses behind you and everybody turns. Well, loud sound is going to cause you to be startled, right? A startle reflex. So what's important to know about classical conditioning is that it's not voluntary behavior, right? I don't make decisions based on rewards and punishments. I make decisions based on these involuntary automatic things. And we call these what? Respondent behaviors. Okay, now that we have a deep understanding of associative learning and these kind of automatic reflexes, what is this study? Let's start with our main gentleman here. What is his name? I've already said it before. Ivan, Ivan what? Ivan Pavlov. Now, what do we know about Pavlov? Now, Pavlov was a Russian physiologist, okay? He wasn't actually a psychologist, and that's important. A lot of people we talk about, like Freud, weren't actually psychologists. They studied other things and kind of stumbled into the field of psychology. Now, Pavlov was interested in the digestive system of dogs. And you might be thinking, well, that's not really interesting. Well, he actually won the Nobel Prize for this research in 1904. So there are some people who care about the digestive system of dogs. So here's what he did. He put a tube outside of a dog to collect the saliva, right, connected to the salivary glands, right? Because in order to study saliva and digestion, you have to collect saliva. So the dog would drool, the dog's mouth would water, and it would collect it outside of the dog's mouth. I know it looks like a tongue, but think of this as a tube. Now, how do you actually get a dog to drool or salivate? Well, you need some sort of stimulus that's going to automatically cause a drool, and in this place, it would be some sort of food. So here's kind of a couple terms to think about. We have a stimulus and we have a response, right? This is kind of fundamental psychology, right? A stimulus is something that stimulates your senses, hear, smell, taste, touch, and a response is how you respond to that stimulus. A stimulus and a response. All right, so here's a study. Now, as Pavlov and his associates are giving food and this tube is filling up with saliva, uh, they notice that whenever they give the dog food, that would happen. That's normal. But here's what happened. When Pavlov and associates would walk through the door, okay, what they noticed was this tube, here's my saliva, was filled up with liquid before the food even came, okay? In other words, the sound of the door or the sight of the white lab coat or the sounds from the hallway the dogs were anticipating the food was going to come and the dogs would start to drool. This is the light bulb moment for Pavlov. Let's look back to our definition. A type of associated learning which two stimuli are paired together produce a new learned response. So what are we pairing together? What we're pairing together is the stimuli of the food with the sound of the door is creating this new learned response. So that's what we mean by pairing two stimuli together. Now, you also have to understand that Pavlov was Russian, so everything we know about Pavlov was translated to English. So there's actually some conspiracy out there that Pavlov actually never used a bell, right? That maybe it was a buzzer or it was a metronome or a tuning fork, right? So the other things to use besides a bell. But this is what Pavlov did, okay? Here's his study. What he did is he broke it up into three phases, right? He's really testing this theory that dogs can anticipate and humans can anticipate something to come. We have a before, during, and after stage. Now, the general idea makes sense. What we have to know is the terminology involved, okay? So let's break this down together. We see the word stimulus, right? If something automatically causes you to react, right? Think about a puff of air, a bee sting, and a loud sound automatically causes you to react. We call this an unconditioned, unconditioned what? Unconditioned stimulus. Okay? Unconditioned. So what do we mean by this? The word unconditioned means unlearned. It happens automatically, right? Let's go back to our respondent behaviors. Blinking, pain, startle. You don't have to learn that. It's going to happen automatically. So that's an unconditioned stimulus is going to cause what? I'll use a different thing right here, okay? That's going to cause what we call an unconditioned, what? An unconditioned response. Okay? Okay? Meaning, you didn't learn to drool, you didn't learn to blink, you didn't learn to have pain. It happens automatically, involuntarily, right? And by the way, we can abbreviate this. We'll say unconditioned stimulus is the US, and the unconditioned response will be our UR. Okay? So the food will automatically cause the dog to salivate, and this tube is going to fill up with water, right? That's the saliva, okay? 
Now, where does the bell come in? Well, Pavlov wanted to try other things out. What else could he make the dog salivate to? Not just the sound of the door, not just the white lab coats, but what if it was a bell, right? What if it was a bell and then the food? Would the dog salivate to the sound of a bell? Well, before the study begins, a bell is just a bell, right? And the reason we say that is that the bells we call a neutral stimulus. Neutral means doesn't affect anything, right? We'll say NS. Meaning, when you start a study or nothing's involved, a bell should never cause a dog to salivate, right? It's neutral, it doesn't do anything, right? Without learning, a bell should do nothing, right? There should be no drooling, right? Nothing in the, nothing in the tube, okay? So neutral means nothing's gonna happen, uh, we haven't paired it with anything yet, it's just a sound, and that's it. But here's where the learning comes in. Here's the during phase. What if we pair together the neutral stimulus, the bell, with the unconditioned stimulus, the food, and we pair these together over and over again. So bell, food, bell, food, ding, ding, food, right? In fact, I'll get my bell here, right? Bell, food, bell, food, bell, food. And we do this over and over and over again. What's gonna happen, right? I'll have my little air. Eventually what's gonna happen is the dog's gonna learn in anticipation that the food's gonna come, and the dog is gonna salivate at the bell alone. And the moment that happens, classical conditioning has occurred. We also can change a couple names. Instead of the neutral stimulus, we now call this bell, after the study, the conditioned stimulus, right? Condition means learned. The conditioned stimulus, okay? And this would be our CS, right, our CS. And the moment it causes the dog to drool, right, the moment of acquisition, we are going to call this now the conditioned response. The conditioned response. Or, let's do our abbreviation, the CR. Okay? So, the moment the bell, it causes the dog to drool, and by the way, I need my little drool there, without the presence, right, there's no meat here, without the presence of the U.S., classical conditioning has occurred. This is Ivan Pavlov's famous study. Now, a couple things to think about. We know the study with the dog, but this happens in real life. So I want us to think about not just the study, not just dogs and bells, but where can we see this in our lives because it happens to us all the time. So let's think about the first one. We call this conditioned taste aversion or the Garcia effect named after the psychologist who studied this. Do you ever eat something and feel sick afterward and you're like, I cannot eat that food again, right? You get food poisoning. What's happening is classical conditioning. What we have to do is think about our terminology. So let's think about this together. Let's imagine, for example, uh, that you ate a nice uh, piece of fish, right? Maybe salmon, maybe tuna, right? Well, what you didn't know is that there is bacteria in the fish, okay? And what is the bacteria gonna do? The bacteria is gonna make you sick. I'll write the word nauseous, right? Nausea, right? You don't have to learn that, right? It's a respond to reflexive behavior. You're going to feel sick, right? But then what happens is we have the neutral stimulus, right? Just smelling fish should not make you sick, right? Smelling tuna, smelling uh, uh, salmon. It's just a smell, nothing there. But because you associate that smell with the feeling of sick, eventually the smell has become the conditioned stimulus and just the smell alone is gonna cause what? It's gonna cause it to feel nauseous. And by the way, I love this kind of formula I have, the USUR, NSCSCR. It's kind of a nice way to think about conditioning, right? So now the smell alone is going to cause you to feel nauseous, okay? All right, what would be another example? Well, a lot of trauma, we often call this fear conditioning, involves classical conditioning, right? Imagine you were in a car crash, okay? And I'll use my marker again, okay? A car crash is gonna make you what? Without learning, right, remember automatic involuntary, is gonna make you fearful. Okay, feared, scared, or whatever you wanna call it, right? You don't have to learn that. It's probably pretty scary to be in a car accident, right? Let's say you were driving in a blue car, right? Well, what happens is a blue car should never make you scared. It's just a color. It doesn't do anything, but what are we doing? We're forming an association. And over time, what could happen is the blue car alone could cause you to be fearful, right? 
You should never be fear of a blue car, but if it does, it becomes our conditioned stimulus. Okay, so you see a blue car on the road, you might have a panic attack, you know classical conditioning has occurred. So always think about real life examples. All right guys, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe. See you next time.